my name is Mauricio Mejia. I work at the OECD, so maybe just for those that don't know, it's international organization, organization for economic cooperation and development, and we have a big team working on open government, civic space, and citizen participation, where I'm leading the work on citizen participation. So we don't only look at digital technologies, civic tech, etc. We also look at non-digital participation. The session before was about deliberation, so we also have a big chunk of our work dealing with deliberative processes, citizen assemblies, participatory budgeting, etc. So as you may know, basically OECD works on two big fits, giving recommendations to countries on how to improve X, Y, y practices, but also gathering data and building these frameworks of understanding so then it can uh, become, let's say, a more uh, international or global understanding of different practices. So what I'm going to present to you today, it's kind of a thinking exercise, so neither of the neither country rep uh, recommendations or data. It's rather this exercise of thinking that we have been working with my team on trying to solve the question that the panel this morning was asking, how can we make sure that civic tech actually improves, supports uh, democracy? Um, and this question, uh, we started actually thinking it because in October 2023, we organized an event at the OECD on this question of civic tech. And it was actually when uh, when they asked me to, if I wanted to organize this event, I was like, but civic tech's been there for a while. I don't think no one is gonna be interested. This is 2010. Why are we talking about civic tech again? But uh, again, I'm very surprised. Lots of people turned out, lots of interest from countries and policymakers and government representatives, but especially they were interested to answer one question. It was like, does civic tech has already had an impact on democracy or not at all? And if not, what can we do to actually make civic tech more impactful? So that was kind of the, the discussion that we had uh, very briefly because we're obsessed at the, at the OECD to define things. We cannot talk about anything if we don't define it. So we produce this quick definition of civic tech as digital technology that reinforces democracy by enabling the public, very broad, to be informed participating in decision and policy making it to increase government responsiveness and accountability. But what I actually like about this definition is that we see it as a two kind of sided approach. One is this interaction between public institutions and the public, but also an inner interaction between the public. So how public opinion, building public opinion, allowing some society to exchange, to build ideas, etc. So as I was saying, this conference, let's say the main output was to challenge the impact of civic tech, but also acknowledging the fact that it's been there for a while, but maybe that we were in a turning point of, uh, in, if I can summarize a whole day of conversation, it was how to bring power to civic technologies or how to actually embed these technologies into power structures, into decision-making spaces where decisions are actually made. And not only as a side kind of uh, side area where citizens can provide some ideas and recommendations, but actually in, embedded in uh, in decision-making process. So in some, our team will be thinking about it, thinking, asking some experts how to build a framework or how to think about civic tech in a different way. And um, we are trying to think it as a public space. And this exercise of thinking with all of you about this idea of thinking as a public space. And so first of all, why, uh, first of all, I want you to think maybe quickly about your favorite public space, about whether your favorite library, your favorite park, it's a little bit pixelized, but should be a beautiful park in the picture. So just to think about it in, uh, let's say, do we leave out the technology aspect, we leave out the digital uh, setting, to think about how we individually, but also collectively, use and interact in these spaces. And um, I actually asked, just before entering the room, so my apologies, ChatGPT. If it could define what a public space is in a nutshell, ChatGPT helped it to define it as a physical or a virtual area that is open and accessible to people. These spaces are typically designed to encourage social interaction, community engagement, and civic activities. Examples can be from physical public spaces such as parks, plazas, streets, libraries, and public buildings but also virtual public spaces that could include online for us, social media platforms, and other digital environments where people can gather and interact. So that's how ChatGPT defines it. And you'll see, I think there's something to, to build upon that. Um, 
And so, for example, if we try to think about civic knowledge as digital public spaces, let's maybe take one by one. If we think about a library, in a library, the library has a purpose. It was built for a purpose, which is we go, we read, we work, we exchange ideas, we think about new things. We go to a park, maybe the purposes are different. In a park, we might exercise, we might meet friends, picnic, relax, sometimes if you're not today in London or in another moment. Um, but there's a defined purpose that actually then changes the whole structure and the whole decisions that will make up building that space. Um, but there are certain rules also, rules that would allow us to do or not to do things that we collectively decide what can we do in a library, um, probably not be able to use, listen to my music out loud. In a park, maybe I am. In a park, I can maybe drink and eat. In a library, there might be certain rules. But there are also certain rules that are being implemented by people, by some guardians or some roles that are played by maybe civil servants, such as the librarian, the person that will actually help us navigate all this amount of information. In a park, maybe we will have a guardian or a park uh, security officer that will tell you which are the limits of the activities that you may do or you may not do. So there are rules and there are people that actually enforce those rules. Uh, then we have certain infrastructures and not only physical or technical infrastructures, but also, for example, books. Library needs books and needs places to put the books. It needs tables, lighting. Etc. but also buildings, literally a building where we can go and use the library. A park, I mean, it's physical space, but there needs certain physical aspects. Uh, it's open, and I think that's also a key characteristic besides being public, so not taking away all the private spaces, which might be different in terms of thinking, but so open, there have to be certain inclusivity, there should be accessible to everyone. Uh, there have uh, a certain rules in terms of how to look out for the people that might not be able to come, certain subsidies, etc. So there is a willingness to make these spaces as open and as accessible and inclusive as possible. Um, just checking the time. So if we kind of continue this idea of thinking about civic technologies as public spaces and digital public spaces, and if we try to bring and split out these four categories of main, let's say, areas where governments could be having an impact in building those, uh, those spaces. If we start with, for example, the purpose, if I follow my own uh, logic, uh, we need to give them a purpose. And that's maybe to start with the question that I was saying at the beginning of bringing the power to these civic technologies or civic spaces in online spaces. Meaning that, for example, we can acknowledge that certain spaces are only to build public opinion, only for citizens to exchange, to give ideas, to exchange ideas, to be informed, to discuss about those ideas, to build an individual, but then also a public opinion. We acknowledge, we define it as it is, that is the purpose of that space, and so we'll build that space as for that objective. But there might be other spaces where we actually want these spaces to be able to impact on decision making. But so we need to give those pur that purpose to the space. We need to be able to connect that digital space to decision making, whether it's in parliament, whether it's at the local level, at the national level, whatever. And so for example, I'm gonna use two examples to be able to give you some concrete ideas about how it looks like in real life. One in Brazil, one in Estonia. In Brazil is the Decidim-based uh, Brazil Participativo platform that is connected to actually, so that's the first point, is connected to decision making. It's connected to the budget process, to the national budget process, before the collective drafting, there is a moment where there is a space, there is an opportunity for citizens to comment uh, on the budget priorities, and then those priorities and that kind of collective thinking is then sent to, to parliament. So the purpose is clear, it's a platform that the government uses to collect citizen input for important conversations such as the budget and currently the climate action of Brazil. Uh, and if we take the Estonian example, uh, the purpose of the citizen, citizen initiative of Ravalgatus, if I, my Estonian is in a very good shape, uh, it's to actually allow citizens to facilitate the process of petitions. It's a clear purpose. It facilitates creating, understanding, reading, collecting signs, signatures, 
and sending those petitions to whether the national or the local parliament. So the purpose is clear. Then if we go to the rules, the rules are very important. Uh, and the rules, as I was saying, if we take back our analogy of the of public spaces, is what we can do, but also people and protections and watchdogs that help us being, uh, let's say, uh, attacked or not being able to use those spaces as they were supposed to. So for example, if we think about digital civic space, that's the protection of essential rights, freedoms, liberties for us as individuals to be able to exercise our rights and to participate in the digital or the physical world. Or like Maria was, Maria Baron was saying this this morning. Uh, and for example, in uh, these combined with digital rights, so the fact that those rights are protected, that there are certain protections such as the GDPR in Europe, but also if we take again Brazil example, the Marco Civil the Internet, so the framework for protection of rights in the internet, that gave us a robust protection for any activity online. But another layer that could be integrated is the what do we do, the rules of the games when we are in those spaces, so the moderation, what can we say, how can we say it, and if someone starts insulting whoever in the platform, there are some moderation rules in the uh, uh, Brazil Participativo platform that it's very clear, if you insult someone, if you use homophobia or transphobia or racism language, you're expelled, you're out. There are no spaces for this in this platform. So it's a, uh, it's a stick said clearly in the platform, you want to participate, you want to join this space. There are these certain things that you can do and these certain things that you cannot do. And so of course then all of these translate into the design uh, of the space, what can be done and how to moderate. The, the, the other layer, the infrastructure, which maybe it's more important, and I'm very happy that then uh, I think we have more experience and more concrete examples after, after this. But uh, on one side, of course, the digital public infrastructure, we're also talking about tools here. We know them a lot. Decidim, I think all this community has been named them. Consul, Decidim, Polis. This building plus this software that shouldn't be thought as a, soft, as a project, but rather as a policy, as something that we then have resources to maintain. And that's a very important aspect. It's not only launching uh, the sitting platform, but thinking about how it's going to be maintained, how it's going to be developed, and how it is thought as an infrastructure. Because it's not only that layer, maybe the front office of participation that citizens see as the sitting, but if I also yeah, I take again the Brazil example, I think it's interesting that in Brazil they connected their electronic digital identity, which is widely used in the country to provide citizens with a very easy to connect way to the platform. Not only as a user, user experience in a more friendly way, but also to give actually some meaning to the participation of the citizens because we can assure that one person, one vote, which is the whole problem of some of the online participation processes. Uh, and, and in Estonia it's exactly the same. They use the already existing digital infrastructure of the country to just embed the online petitions and be able to use those infrastructures to empower and let's say dynamize and make more amplify the processes in those spaces. And last but not least, the open aspect. As I said, a library a park should be open. Everyone should be going. We should be encouraging people that are, don't have don't have the means to go. And in these platforms and processes and spaces should be the same. Uh, importantly, looking for digital inclusion, but also accessibility programs for people that are not that don't have the digital skills or unequal access or unequal usages. Uh, minorities are not being able to participate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, of course, the transparency aspect, uh, open source, but not only being able to make those uh, spaces accountable and making people understand how these spaces work. Um, sorry, one second, I cannot. There is a little bit of a time. Yeah. Um, so. Those are the two examples that, are, that I've been using and happy to provide you with links and other interesting uh, resources if you're interested in knowing more about these two. And these are just two and I took them because they're opposites and in two different uh, regions of the world, but there are many. Many that are showing that way of how to move from maybe this first era of civil technologies thought as a tool approach, focus on how the technology is developed, how the better, the more shiny, the more innovative technology can be improved. Thinking, we have been thinking a lot about how to make the youth citizen participation experience better and more dynamic and more user friendly, but maybe shifting from that understanding to moving to a more policy uh, 
comprehensive approach to understanding civic technologies as a digital public space, where we can actually include these four layers, so infrastructures to make sure that these res uh, remain, that these spaces are not just tools and projects that then die once the political willingness or the policy in question is out, but actually that they have a purpose, they stay, there are rules, so citizens uh, can participate freely, and, um, and last but not least, are those are connected with the formal decision spaces, such as parliament, or with actually important topics that citizens want to decide, like the budget or the climate decisions in Brazil. Um, that's all uh, for me. So thank you very much, first for TikTok, for inviting, and also for you to stay here listening and happy to answer any questions.